Hi, my name is Kenny Smith. Um, I'm based in the Centre for Language Evolution at the University of Edinburgh. I'm going to present an experiment and um, two corpus analyses showing that languages adapt to the communicative needs of their users. So just to explain the um, context for this work, in our group we're interested in how languages evolve as a result of the cycle of learning and use through which they persist. So one way of um, thinking about this is that individuals encounter linguistic data in the world, people using um, language, and that data forms the basis for a process of language learning which enables them to form a representation of the grammar of that language, it's like a mental representation of how the language works. That, that grammar doesn't just sit in your head, you um, use the language in what Harford called the arena of use um, to meet your communicative goals to get stuff done in the world. And as a kind of inadvertent side effect of using language to do stuff, you generate linguistic data which might form the basis for learning in other individuals. So language is transmitted through this cycle of learning and use, and as a result, languages are shaped by um, the processes of learning and use. So in one line of work that we pursue, um, we look at how even quite subtle biases in language learning can shape linguistic systems because those biases in learning are repeatedly applied as languages are transmitted through this process. Today I'm going to actually focus on the kind of other side of this spiral and look at how pro pressures operating during language use can shape the structure of linguistic systems. So I'll do that in two ways. I'll present an experiment showing that um, the communicative task that participants face shapes the structure of artificial linguistic systems in a lab experiment. And then I'll show two corpus studies trying to show the same thing. So looking for signatures of adaptation to communicative need in um, historical um, corpora. So the idea is that by using these two techniques, we can um, investigate the way in which languages adapt to communicative needs at very short timescales in the lab and then at much longer timescales in historical corpora. OK, so the experiment is actually um, draws data from two papers from work um, with Monica Tamriz, Hannah Cornish, James Winters, and Simon Kirby. In both of these papers, we report experiments where participants um, do an artificial language learning and communication um, experiment. So participants come into the lab in pairs. We train them on a miniature linguistic system for labeling objects like the kinds of objects we see here. A slightly different set of objects in the, in the two papers that doesn't actually turn out to be um, particularly important. So you learn a set of labels for these kinds of objects, and then you use the miniature language you've learned to try and communicate with your partner. So you play a little director matcher game where the director is prompted with one of these objects and has to produce a signal to enable the matcher to pick the correct object from an array of possibilities. So a simple little communication game, and you just play that over and over and over again with your partner. And we're interested in how the um, how the structure of the communication system adapts to the details of the communicative task you face. Okay, so the baseline result um, for this kind of experiment for us comes from this um, 2015 paper. So in this um, experiment, um, we got pairs of participants into the lab. We trained them on 12 labels for each of these 12 objects. Those are randomly generated labels, so a kind of idiosyncratic um, lexicon of just labels for referring to these objects. What you find if you uh, in this what we found in this experiment was that participants basically just maintained that lexicon that we um, provided them with. This lexicon is perfectly functional for the communicative task they face, it provides a unique label for each object, so it's great for communication. Both participants have been trained on it quite extensively, so they just preserve that lexicon. So what James was interested in doing was looking at what happens if we slightly change the communicative task and force participants to generalize during interaction. So in the 2015 paper, we trained participants on a label for each object. What James did instead was rather than training them on labels for all of these um, M16 objects, he just trained them on labels for four objects. So you were trained that, uh, on labels for each of these four objects, but then when it came time to communicate with your partner, you were rapidly forced to figure out a way of generalizing those labels in a way that would allow you to communicate about the entire space of objects. So your communicative task forces you to generalize um, somehow from that smaller set of um, starting um, labels. 
And what James found was that when participants are, are required to generalize in this way during interaction, they rapidly develop a system which has some structure which facilitates that kind of generalization. So if I add hyphens, you can see the structure a bit better. This is the final system that one dyad produced, which is quite a, um, a, a, a number of dyads converged on this kind of solution. But each label um, consists of two parts. The first part conveys information about the um, shape of the object, and the second part of the label conveys information about the color. And other people have shown um, um, similar results in a similar paradigm where you're forced to generalize during communication. You develop a system which enables you to generalize along the relevant dimensions and communicate about this entire set of reference. Okay, so that was a, um, just to give you a little bit more detail on the communicative task participants were facing here. That was on a task that looks like this, where you have a director and a matcher on every trial. And actually those roles are fixed. So the director is always the director. The director is just prompted on each trial with an object and they have to say something to enable the matcher to pick that object from an array, but the director doesn't have access to the um, context in which their utterance is going to be interpreted. So the director just sees the target, not the context. Uh, unbeknownst to the directors in, in this first condition that James ran, um, there are actually two kinds of contexts. In one kind of context, the matcher only actually needs the shape information. So uh, specifying color doesn't help here. So we'll call those shape relevant contexts. And in this, this kind of context, color relevant contexts, um, actually providing shape information is no use. What the matcher really needs is color. But of course, the director can't tell on any given trial whether they need to convey shape or color. And so they end up conver converging on a system where they just convey both simultaneously in that compositional um, manner. But James also ran a condition where the director does have access to the context in which their utterance is going to be interpreted. So the director is told, say something which will enable the matcher to pick out this object from an array that looks like this. And in that circumstance, what we see is a different kind of system developing in pairs during interaction, where the director flexibly encodes different kinds of information depending on the context involved in that trial. So in shape relevant trials, directors just encode shape information using quite a simple lexicon for distinctions based on shape. In color relevant trials, they produce a more complex signal. So they actually send two words to the matcher, which specify both shape in the first word and color in the second word. So actually, although only color is necessary, participants were quite, in general, quite reluctant not to specify shape information. So if you change the fine grained details of the communicative task, you change the kind of um, communication system that participants converge on during interaction. James also ran conditions where actually across trials, all you ever needed to convey was shape information. So participants only ever encountered shape relevant trials and the director either had access to that fact or had to infer it through the par pattern of um, communicative successes and failures that they experienced. But in both of those conditions, what happens is that pairs converge on one of these simpler lexicons where you only encode the relevant um, shape information. Okay, so what that experiment shows is that um, these miniature languages quite rapidly adapt to the communicative needs of their users through that process of repeated use, repeated interaction. If you need to generalize, you can develop a language which allows you to generalize. Um, if you, it, and languages develop during interaction, which allow participants to encode the information they need to convey. So that's quite nice, and it shows this rapid adaptation in very controlled conditions. But we'd like to have some confidence that we can see the same kinds of adaptation to communicative need um, in natural languages um, rather than just in artificial languages. And so for that, we turn to um, corpus work. So I'm going to report two corpus studies by Andres Karius. He's just finishing up his PhD in Edinburgh, supervised by me, Richard Blythe, and Simon Kirby. Okay, both these are based around the idea that we can track um, fluctuations in communicative need in corpora. So the things that we need to talk about um, using language change over time. So in times of war, you need to talk about a bunch of kind of militaristic stuff. In the UK, we spent most of 2019 talking about Brexit and international trade or the lack of it. And obviously, 2020, we're all spending a lot of time talking about masks and Zoom bombing and that kind of thing. So the idea is that in natural language, communicative need fluctuates over time. And the prediction is that language should adapt to those fluctuations in communicative need. We should be able to see some signature of these changes in need in the um, linguistic system itself. So in order to um, see whether that's true, we first need to be able to quantify these fluctuations in um, communicative need. 
So Andres came up with a way of doing that, way of quantifying topical fluctuations. So the idea is we're going to um, automatically identify topics in a historical corpus uh, um, sample of um, written texts. And a topic is going to be a group of semantically related co-occurring words. So for a given target word, say latte, we can look up um, that word in the corpus and we can identify the words that it uniquely co-occurs with, and that's the topic associated with that target word. So for a target word like latte, the topic words would include other types of coffee and also words related to um, kind of cafe culture. And then our measure of topical fluctuation is just going to be to track the changes in frequency of those topic words. And we call this the advection measure. So um, advection is a term for, for, from um, physics that refers to the bulk, um, the transport of a particle through bulk motion. So the idea is that words are kind of carried along um, in the um, kind of flowing river of their topic. That's, the, that's where that term comes from. Okay, so um, we measure the change in frequency of the topic, and that gives us a measure of fluctuations in topics in a corpus. Okay, so the first thing that Andres did was checked whether um, advection actually captured anything at all about changes in word frequency. So what this graph shows is the correlation between changes in word frequency on the x-axis and changes in topic frequency, the topics associated with those words, in the y-axis. So um, positive values for word frequency are words which are increasing in frequency, and positive values for advection are topics which are increasing in importance. And this is in the um, over just about 200 years of data in the corpus of historical American English. And what you see is there is a relationship, a, a clear relationship between changes in word frequency and advection. If, uh, words associated with topics which are increasing in frequency tend to themselves increase in frequency. So we can see some um, uh, linguistic consequences of these changes in communicative need. <clears throat> so Andrews was interested in whether um, um, lexical innovation um, reflects changes in these communicative needs. So the idea is that if a topic is increasing importance, we need to drag in some additional linguistic terminology for talking about that um, topic. So that would be a way in which communicative need um, shapes the structure of the lexicon. So to do that, Andres um, created a test set of 73 successful new nouns which entered the corpus since the 1970s and kind of rapidly shot up in frequency. For each one of those words, we trace its topic back for 100 years and, and track those topical fluctuations. And then we just ask, well, is there anything unusual happening to the topics associated with these words which suddenly take off? And it turns out there is. It turns out the lexical innovations occur in topics which are hot, which are trending upwards. So this shows the um, results for latte, which turns out to be quite a typical word in this respect. So this is the frequency of latte, and um, you can see it shoots up starting in the 1990s. This is the set of topic words associated with latte. Um, this is the frequency changes for those topic words. This is the mean and um, confidence intervals. And then you can see that the point at which um, latte shoots up in frequency is also a point at which that topic is increasing in importance. So um, the, the innovation, the lexical innovation occurs when communicative need in that kind of cafe, coffee, cafe culture topic is unusually high. And it turns out that latte is um, a good example. Just over half of the words that Andres looked at show this pattern where the frequency shoots up when the topic is trending upwards. And only about 10% of words show the reverse pattern where the frequency of the word shoots up when the topic is trending downwards. Okay, so based on that work, you might draw the conclusion that, well, maybe words are just, the fates of words just depend, depends entirely on their topic. When the topic's gone up, all the words associated with that topic go up. When the topic falls, all the words fall in frequency. Um, that actually wasn't what we expected when we started this line of work. We um, assumed, and we think it's quite a widespread assumption in, linguistic, uh, in linguistics, that um, words actually compete. And in particular, near synonyms should compete um, to kind of represent part of a semantic space. So we were a bit puzzled about how to reconcile those um, the observation that topicality seems to drive a lot of frequency changes with the expectation that we should see competition between words. And Andres had the idea that maybe this actually depends on communicative need. Maybe both of these things are happening at the same time, just in different parts of the lexicon. Okay, so to test this hypothesis, we need a measure of um, fluctuation and communicative need that we have already from advection. So all we need is a measure of competition. Okay, so that's what Andres does in this um, second paper. 
So the way we detect competition is actually quite um, intuitive. If you have some focal word that's increasing in frequency, it must have got that probability mass from somewhere. There must be some other words that are decreasing in frequency to um, compensate. And the question is, where, where are those other words in the lexicon? One possibility, yeah, are they among semantically close words or semantically distant words? So one possibility is that when this word increases in frequency, it's basically grabbing that probability mass from a closely, semantically closely related word. So this would be a case of competition between near synonyms. When this word goes up, its competitor goes down in frequency. And that means you don't have to look very far in semantic space to equalize the probability mass this guy is gaining. Um, he's taking it from this guy. So that would be an example of competition. An alternative possibility is that as the focal word increases in frequency, its whole topic is increasing in frequency. So that means that all the semantically close words are also increasing in frequency at the same time. And you have to look much further off in semantic space to equalize the probability mass. So these are words that are semantically very distant and probably belong to a different topic. So all of these guys are increasing in frequency because the topic is doing well and they're grabbing that frequency mass from some other topic. So this is not this is a case of competition between topics rather than between words. Okay, so we just um, apply those measures to a corpus. I'm going to plot the results but just to talk you through this graph. Up the y-axis is going to be advection. So um, advection values of around about zero reflect words associated with topics which are pretty stable. High advection values reflect um, words which are associated with topics which are increasing in, in um, importance in the population. And this is the equalization range, so how far you have to go in semantic space to equalize the probability mass that this word is gaining. Equalization values around about zero indicate cases of clear competition, where the word is grabbing probability mass from something closely related. The higher numbers reflect the um, absence of clear competition between words or competition between topics. And Andresi's prediction is you should have a positive correlation here. So um, when a topic is relatively stable, words have to compete to be associated with that topic. On the other hand, when the topic is increasing in importance, there's no real need for the words to compete. They can all just kind of ride the topic because people want to talk a lot about that topic. And so there's, there's room for multiple words, so less competition there. And that is indeed um, what we see. So for kind of stable, boring topics like this one, you see competition between words. So funding is competing with appropriation for one slot in the lexicon. Airplane is competing with aeroplane for one slot in the lexicon. Over on the up in this corner, we see topics which are trending. So, for instance, military and paraphernalia in the build up to World War II as a topic of rising importance. And there's very little evidence of competition between terms associated with that topic. So, whether you get competition between words or between topics depends on communicative need. Okay, so just wrap up languages are shaped by their learning and use, and languages adapt to the communicative needs of their users. We can show that in lab experiments and controlled circumstances. We can also see the hallmarks of that kind of adaptation in natural language corpora. Okay, thank you.